Today on Destined to Win. We need to speak what God says. We need to declare God's promises. We need to defy the evidence with our confession of faith. We need to tell the giant he's going down. We need to tell the king our God is able. We need to say to the naysayers, they're not dead, but they sleep. We need to look Ahab in the face and say, get off the mountain. It is going to pour. Are you ready to declare what God said in your life? Hey everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Today I'm going to be sharing with you from a series on prayer. I was inspired by the recent movie War Room to revisit and remind our congregation about the importance and the power of prayer. And I believe this series will inspire you too to press into God in prayer. You see, prayer isn't this passive last resort thing that might work. It's how we wage war against the plan of the enemy and lay hold of the promises that are ours through Christ. So put on your war paint, clothe yourself in camo, and get ready to war with your hands in prayer. Today we are continuing in our series called War Room. It's based on the movie where you just saw the clip from. It's a movie that's inspirational in every way. It's, it's kind of like the Rocky movie of prayer because when you remember back in the day when you saw Rocky, you came out inspired to want to box. And, and this movie will inspire you to want to do a different kind of fighting, fighting in prayer. Since I saw the movie, I have prayed more during that spirit period of time in my life than I ever have in my entire life. I mean, just, just motivated to pray, motivated to, to build some prayer closets in my house. I, we built two prayer closets in our house or turned two rooms into prayer closets, three if you count the shower, but, but two rooms into prayer closets because we're just so inspired to want to pray. And that's what my, my hope and my prayer is for each and every one of you, that, that you'll be inspired through this series to, to go before the Lord in prayer, knowing that prayer makes the impossible possible, that, that prayer does turn the odds in our favor, that prayer does bring God into activate in our life, and prayer calls for heavenly intervention in our earthly affairs, and that it works. It really does work. And so we've been inspired to pray in this series, and today what I want to do is I want to pick up from where we left off last time that I spoke Last week, Pastor Chris spoke about the wall of remembrance, the importance of remembering what God has done in your past, the answered prayers that have come through for you as a springboard into the fact that if God did it before, that he could do it again. But today what I want to do is I want to go back and pick it up from the, the last time that I spoke where we were looking at one of the most famous prayers in the Bible, the prayer of Elijah for rain after there had been a drought for over three years. And, and so if you have your Bible, 1 Kings chapter number 18, and as you're turning there, let me remind you that when we look at the prayer of Elijah, we're, we're looking at somebody that, that wasn't um, superhuman, that didn't get his prayers answered because he was a prophet or had a special calling. But James chapter 5 verse number 17 says, Elijah was human just like we are. In other words, God answers the prayers of not just the prophets, but he answers the prayers of butchers and bakers and candlestick makers just like you and I, regular people, regular Joes, and that God can do extraordinary things through our prayers. Reminds me of a story as we get ready to read from 1 Kings that I heard from a guy by the name of Mark Batterson who I interviewed on TBN on the Praise the Lord show once, and he told this story about a guy named Honey who he called the circle maker. And he said this was a time this guy lived where um, Israel was going through another drought. It was right before the generation before Jesus. And um, again, they were endangered of being wiped out. And God seemed nowhere to be found. Miracles were very scarce. And so people's faith was kind of low. But there was this one guy by the name of Honey who, who believed in the power of prayer. And so he decided to come out into the town square, if you will, with a six-foot staff. And with the precision of a math compass, he, he took that staff and he, he stretched it out and he began to draw a circle in the ground, 90 degrees and 180 degrees and 270 degrees and 360 degrees. And when he had enclosed himself in the circle, he prayed this prayer. He said, Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not move 
from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. And as his prayers went up, the raindrops began to come down in a sprinkle, and kind of like just, just intermittent one. But everybody was so excited that that rain was finally there. But, but Honey was not excited with, with that kind of rain. That wasn't the rain that he was praying for. That wasn't enough rain in order to put an end to the drought. And so as everybody was kind of thinking that this was supernatural and fantastic and everything, he stayed in the circle and he prayed on. And he said, not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns and pits and caverns. Sooner did he pray, but the rain turned into a torrential downpour. People who witnessed it said that no drop was less than the size of an egg, and people had to escape to the Temple Mount because of the flash flooding, and it was almost like the rain now was going to cause catastrophe. And as everybody went for safety, Honey stayed in the circle, and he prayed more. He said, not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain of your favor, blessing, and graciousness. And suddenly that storm turned into a just nice, steady peaceful rain like a well-timed sun shower and a generation was saved because honey believed in the power of prayer a regular person just like you and i who prayed and who god did amazing and miraculous things to and i want to encourage you that god can do great things through your prayer and so don't give up keep praying i think that's why jesus said in luke chapter 18 and verse 1 he said men ought always to pray and never to cease I think he was telling us that because he wanted us to know that God operates on our prayers, that our prayers bring God into active aid in our lives. And so as we launch into this um, story again, I want us to look and answer a question that we began to explore last time. And the question was, how did Elijah get his prayers answered? How come that, that Honey got his prayers answered? And how come, Pastor, that, that my prayers don't get answered like that? And the truth of the matter is we need to know how to pray if we want to get answers to prayer because not all prayer is created equal. Not all prayer works. Not all prayer brings results. There's lots of people that are praying lots of different ways apart from the principles of the scripture. And when we pray apart from the principles of the scripture, we're not promised the answers that God has said are ours. And so we have to find out what does God say about prayer? How does God say we ought to pray? And you remember a couple weeks ago we looked at the first three things. I boiled it down to four four things that I said and that we need to practice in our prayer time. But today I want to talk to you about this, this fourth thing that I never got to. And it's what I call praying prophetically. Praying prophetically. And simply what that means is making sure that what we say is in line with what we pray. Praying is, is one thing. Asking God to intervene. Standing on a promise. Finding a promise is great. It's the beginning. It's the start of prayer. But if we find a promise and pray a promise, and then after we pray, speak everything in opposition to the promise that we just prayed, we are canceling the prayer that we just prayed. And so what God wants us to do is God wants us to learn to keep our words in line with our prayers. To keep what comes out of our mouth in line with his promises. Even when it doesn't look like God, God's promises are going to come to pass. And so I want to look at this in, in the story, 1 Kings chapter number 18, beginning in verse 41. It says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. Now we know from exploring the story a little deeper last time that Elijah was the only one who heard the sound of the abundance of rain. Nobody else heard it, you know, there weren't, you know, storm clouds in the sky at the time that he said this, you know, there wasn't thunder going on, matter of fact, there was little evidence that it was going to rain, and yet he said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Why is that? Because when you are standing on a promise, and when you are fully expecting God to come through, you begin to see things in the spirit, it, it resonates with you on the inside, and, and you can see things and hear things and know things are about to come even before they manifest themselves, and so Ahab went up. To eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and then he bowed down on the ground, he put his face between his knees, he's praying, and he said to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. So he went up and looked, and he said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again, and then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising up out of the sea. And so he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot, and go down before the rain stops you. And it happened in the meantime, that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain, and so Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now, imagine the scene with me for just a moment here. Hasn't rained for over three years. 
God speaks to Elijah and he says, it's time to turn out in the faucets of heaven. It's time for the rain to come at your word. Um, and, and Elijah says to his servant, hey, go check it out. By, by now, if, if God is saying it's going to rain, by now there should be some rain clouds rolling in over the sea. We should begin to see evidence that this is about to take place. And so his servant, you know, he's been with Elijah for a while. He saw Elijah call down fire from heaven, and so he's kind of excited. He's expecting that when he gets there, when he gets to the place where he can look over the sea, that there's going to be storm clouds in the, side, in the sky. And he gets there, and he looks, and you know the story, he finds nothing. And he comes back, running back to Elijah, and says, sorry, boss, nothing. I don't see a thing. And Elijah says, again. And he goes, and he looks, and he comes back, and he says, sorry, boss, nothing. And Elijah says, again. He comes back, sorry, boss, nothing again. Sorry, boss, nothing again. Sorry, boss, nothing again. Sorry, boss, nothing again. And six times he goes back and forth, and he keeps seeing nothing. And Elijah keeps saying again, because Elijah, if you remember from last time, is operating in pizza-ready faith. Remember, that's one of the principles of prayer, right? You have to have an expectation. You have to believe that God is going to do what he's promised in order for God to do what he's promised. The scripture says that when we go to God and when we ask in faith, we have to ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. Let not that man or woman think they shall receive anything of the Lord, the scripture says. A double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. What's God saying? You have to believe that God's going to do it. How do you know you're believing? You're expecting. You're looking as if the pizza that you just called up to be delivered to your house is on the way. You're setting the table and you're pulling back the curtain drapes and, and you're looking and you're, you're expecting it to arrive. And Elijah says again, 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 keep looking, keep looking again, again, again. Sometimes it takes the cumulative effect of all of the agains to beat back the devil until he lays, until he lets go of the promises that God wants us to have. Again, don't quit. Again, keep going. And so he goes and he looks and he, he comes back and, and he says, well, I, I saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. And, and you know what I told you last time, I don't really know if he saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. I'm kind of thinking that, that he kind of just threw that in because he was tired of going back in and looking, you know? It's just like, oh, man, what am I going to tell this guy? This is like the sixth time I've done this. He's like, all right, boss. Because it's kind of lame, right? Like a cloud. Did you ever notice that when you lie, it's lame? You know how lies sound better in your head than they actually do, you know? And I don't know that he was really lying, but, you know, if he was going to make it up, he should have said, yeah, yeah, storm clouds, big ones. He's like, the cloud the size of a man's hand was there. You know, that's all I saw. And to Elijah, Elijah was like, all right, that's it. Go tell Ahab it's going to pour. pour. Now imagine if you were there, right, witnessing this thing. Imagine if you were just allowed to run back and forth with the, with the servant. And the servant comes back, and, or you're there with the servant, and you're looking out for the clouds and everything like that. And the servant goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, right there, right there. And you're like, what? 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 what I don't see anything. Yeah, that, right there, right there. That's a bird, man. That's a bird. No, right next to the bird. There, there's a cloud about the size of a bird. It's about the size of a man's hand. That's it. That, that's it. That's it. Let's go tell Elijah. And he comes back and he says, Elijah, Elijah, cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah's like, go tell Ahab. Get off the mountain. It's going to pour. What would you have done if you witnessed that? I'll tell you what I would have done. I would have been like, ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Elijah's lost his mind. Elijah's going crazy. He actually thinks that a cloud the size of a man's hand against the backdrop of an unadulterated sky that is actually crystal clear is evidence that it's going to rain. That's not evidence that it's going to rain. That's evidence that no rain is on the way. But then I begin to think about this laughable declaration. We're talking about praying prophetically. Declaring what God says even when the evidence does not support what God has said. And I started to think about this. I started thinking about the great things that God did to regular people in the Bible. And how they too made laughable declarations based on what they were believing God for. And I began to think about David. How David is a teenage boy. You know, and uh, he's proficient only in slingshot weaponry. You know, he, he stands before this 10-foot-tall giant named Goliath. He's covered in a coat of armor from head to toe and carrying a spear that is so big that, that David can't even lift it up himself. And, and he stands there, and he's getting ready to go out to the battle and to face Goliath, and he's talking to Saul, his king. And do you remember what he says to Saul, his king? 
He says, your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God this day. The God that delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he shall deliver me into the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine. And if I was Saul, you know what I would have did? I would have went. <laughs> David has lost his mind. Does he know who he's going up against? But then David doesn't stop the, the laughable declaration there. David gets on the battlefield. And David looks at this 10-foot tall man of war, decorated champion, I mean, with all of the military you know, badges that he can possibly have. He stares him in the face. David has never been in a military battle in his entire life. He's toyed around on the back of the woods with his slingshot and killed some animals in the process. And David looks at the Philistine and he says, you come against me with the sword and the javelin, but I come against you. In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defiled, and this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I'll strike you down and cut off your head. And if I was Elijah, if I was Goliath, you know what I would did? <laughs> Matter of fact, if you read the story, that's exactly what Goliath does. Goliath says, Am I a dog? That you come against me with some stones and some sticks? He's like, you, you, you're laughable, kid. What are you doing? Laughable declaration in the face of evidence that totally contradicts what David is believing God for. And then I read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And how the king said to them that if you don't bow down and worship the golden statue of me, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood before King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 16. King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And if I was the king, you know what I would have did? <laughs> These kids think that they're fireproof. This, these, these, these kids lost their Did you court jester? Did you hear what they said? They're, they're funnier than you are. Laughable declaration. But then I, then I get to Jesus. And, and, I, and I see Jesus on his way to, to heal a girl who was sick. And as he's going to heal the girl who is sick, he gets word that the girl is no longer sick, but she's dead. And Jesus says, she's not dead, but she sleeps. And everybody who hears Jesus does what? Look at the screen. They laughed at him. Laughable declarations. Declarations that defy the evidence, but stand by what? God has promised, despite what the situation looks like. Elijah says, go tell Ahab, I know a cloud the size of a man's hand is not evidence that it's going to pour, but it's all the evidence that I need because I've got a promise from Almighty God. And in the face of the evidence and despite what the circumstance says, I'm going to declare, thus saith the Lord, because that's how you get rain. And that's how giants move. What's going on is David delusional. Are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego absent from present reality? Was Jesus checked out? Was Elijah engaged in some type of illegal pharmaceutical usage? And so I'm just wondering, what's up with these guys? The answer is that David the giant slayer and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the fireproof friends and Jesus the dead girl raiser and Elijah the rainmaker, they are enacting this principle of prophetic declaration in their praying. They're declaring the situation, not as it is, not as the evidence perpetrates it to be, but as God promised it. They're calling things which be not as though they were. They're speaking life and not death to the situation. They're getting their mouth in line with their prayers. They're watering the seeds of faith that they sowed when they first asked God to intervene in their situation. They were strengthening their assault against the enemy who was blocking their promise and asking God to break through in their life. They're speaking to their mountain instead of about their mountain. They were praying prophetically. That's what we need to do. We need to speak 
what God says. We need to declare God's promises. We need to defy the evidence with our confession of faith. We need to tell the giant he's going down. We need to tell the king our God is able. We need to say to the naysayers they're not dead but they sleep. We need to look Ahab in the face and say get off the mountain. It is going to pour. Are you ready to declare what God said in your life? <laughs> Prophetic declaration. Here's the thing, Jesus taught this emphatically when he taught us how to pray. Listen to what he said, Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, verse number 23 and 24. Jesus says, for assuredly, in other words, take this to the bank. You can't, you know, kind of skirt your way around this. This is, this is not an optional principle. He says, for assuredly, I say to you. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatever things you ask in prayer, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Did you catch the principle? If what we say doesn't line up with what we pray, our mountain will not move. Let me say it again. If what we say doesn't line up with what we pray, our mountain will not move. Prophetic prayer is when we consistently confess, thus saith the Lord, even when the circumstance looks totally different than thus saith the Lord. We need to get our mouth in line with God's word. Our words either make us giant slayers or giant sandwiches. Fireproof or firewood. Rainmakers or rain fakers. We have to declare what God says. It's the difference between talking dumb and talking smart. There's a lot of dumb talk that goes on in many of our lives, myself included. Dumb talk is when we excessively talk about the problem or the mountain we are facing. Now notice I said excessively. Because there are times that you need to tell what's going on. You need to tell the Lord what's going on. You need to tell a prayer partner what's going on. You need to tell the doctor what's going on. Imagine going to the doctor's office because you need a doctor to fix something and, and you walk in the doctor, the doctor comes in and says, well, what can I do for you? And you know, I just came to visit. <laughs> right? There are times when you, when you need to tell what's going on. But dumb talk is when all you do is talk about your problem. All you do, you have strangers, people who you barely know. How you doing? And you think that's an invitation for you to tell them all your business, right? You can't talk about it all the time. You can't talk about your mouth. And you can't, dumb talk is when you declare defeat instead of victory. It's when we talk about the what ifs, even though they haven't happened yet. It's when we curse our outcome instead of declaring blessing over our outcome. It's when anything that comes out of our mouth opposes the promises that God said. But smart talk is when we agree with God. Smart talk is when we say what God says about the situation. Smart talk is when we speak to our mountain about our God instead of about our mountain to anybody who will listen. Smart talk versus dumb talk. Listen to Proverbs 18, 21. It says this very clearly. It says words kill, words give life. They either poison or they're either poison or fruit you choose. So the question is this, are we poisoning our prayers or fertilizing our prayers? Are our words helping, steering us in the direction of God's promise or steering us away from what God says? We cannot pray promises of life and speak words of death. You're watching an excerpt from Pastor Frank's message, Pray Prophetically. For your gift of any amount, you can receive this complete message. Just call 888-700-5262 and request your copy today. This series is near and dear to my heart. As a result of seeing the movie War Room, I established not one but two prayer closets in my house. I totally believe in the power of prayer to change things in our lives. So often we pray, but when we don't see immediate results, we get discouraged, we give up on prayer, or even give up on God. If that's you, Know that God wants to intervene in your situation, and prayer is how we invite God to get involved. Treat your circumstances as a battle and start to war in prayer. Find the promises of God and use them against the enemy in your prayer closet. 
believe that as you pray, even if you don't see immediate results, that blows are being dealt to the circumstances in the prayer realm and that God will turn your stubborn situation around for the good. If you have a need, we have some wonderful people ready to stand with you in prayer. Just call the number on the bottom of your screen and someone will declare God's promises over your situation in prayer. Be sure to join me next week as I continue in this series. And as always, remember these words, with Jesus you are destined to win. Prayer, it's something so basic, yet we often misunderstand its true purpose and power. It's the key to unlocking everything that God has promised in our lives. We need a place where we can go in like Clark Kent and come out like Superman. We need a place where we can exchange the clothes that we try to win in and put on the clothes that God has said is our spiritual armor that we can do battle against the devil with. And that place is our prayer closet. Learn to war with your hands in prayer in the six-part audio series, War Room, for your gift of $25 by calling 888-700-5262 or visit us online at franksantora.cc to order this or many other resources to help you in your Christian walk. Invite God into your situation and declare His promises over your life through prayer today. Hey, I'm Chris, and a while back, my wife and I were praying, and we felt God speak to us about being intentionally generous. I don't know about you, but that's not me. I might leave a good tip at a restaurant or give money to the church, but it's not my nature to do much more. However, I knew God was trying to do something inside of my heart. He wanted to change me and move me from a taker to a giver. So I took a step of faith and followed God's prompting and partnered with Destin to win. Maybe you're like me and you're sitting there and you begin to feel God speak to your heart about taking a step of faith and partner with this TV ministry. It's easy. You can do it online, www.frankcentora.cc or you can give us a call, 1-888-700-5262. Allow God to speak to your heart, just like he did to me and my wife, and move you from a taker to a giver. If you're in the New York City or Connecticut area, we invite you to visit us at one of our locations or join us online every Sunday at faithchurch.cc live. On behalf of Pastor Frank and from all of us at Faith Church, we love you and we'll see you next week.